Hey everybody and welcome to this week's episode of The Roundtable. I'm Hunter Lee and joining me here in San Francisco as always is Spelzy. Hello. And in Santa Monica is Travis Gafford. Hey Hunter, how's it going? I just wanted to say, uh, while I am doing this show, uh, I only tend to use it as a platform to talk about my amazing, even better show called League Center, which premiered yesterday. Uh, it is way better than this show and everyone should watch that one. Uh, it's fantastic, and yeah, now I'm just going to AFK for the rest of this show, so wow. go ahead, Hunter. Well, we're incredibly humbled just to have you on the show with us, as always. You are you are incredibly impressive. So, yes, you have a new show. It's great. Everybody should watch it, but enough about that. You're here now. So, a lot's been happening. We'll get to the giant patch overhaul, massive changes to the game a little bit later, but starting just up front with the esports news, uh, they Riot announced a, or sort of confirmed a long suspected uh, thing on officially making the head coach a paid position now in every esports organization. So coaches or LCS teams are required to have a head coach so designated. They get uh, $12,500 per split from Riot to pay this person, along with $12,500 additional dollars per split to acquire a person house them, whatever else, sort of discretionary funds, much like they do with players. And that uh, designated head coach is required uh, to be on site, but then has the additional permission slash ability to be with the teams during uh, champion select and help them with picks and bans. So kind of a massive change. I think we knew the head coach thing was coming in light of the incarnation stuff that was talked about uh, during the end of last season, but having them in champs in picks and bans was a pretty big surprise. Spelzy, where do you see this having the, the most impact? Um, I don't know if it'll have, like, the greatest impact. I mean, I guess it'll make good coaches, you know, even more of a better impact on their team than bad coaches. Maybe we'll see the skill differentiation of coaches. But I just think it's a solid change. Like, I'm actually, as we've probably, maybe people know from the show, I'm kind of players first, or, or I, like, have been. I kind of have that philosophy. But I think that giving coaches more power is a good thing. And I think from watching Chasing the Cup, actually, it was interesting to watch CLG's coaches in that kind of relegation match with Zuna and them sitting in the bleachers, watching the picks and bans and being like, ban this guy, ban this guy. Oh, no, don't pick this guy. Don't pick this guy. <laughs> and then they're just, like, sitting there in the bleachers. Like, these are the people who they're supposed to, like, be prepped and kind of, like, working with them, and they're just kind of, like, hoping they, like, listen to them. I don't know. So right. I think, like, putting them in the champion select actually, like, makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Seems like a no-brainer, right, Travis? Yeah, I think that this is really cool. I mean, it's kind of funny because I think that oftentimes there is this feeling that Riot doesn't make good decisions unless there's like Reddit threads like forcing them to make these good decisions or something. But this is something that I don't think a lot of people were talking about. And when it came out, everyone was sort of like, "Yeah, that's awesome. Why didn't that always happen in the future in the past?" Um, I cannot tell you how many times. Uh, I have been at the LCS standing next to, like, uh, Kelby or Hotshot or whoever or, you know, other other team uh, coaches and, and staff members who are just sitting there being like, please pick this, please pick that or whatever. Or after a game, uh, especially a loss, like, I hear staff members say, like, we talked about this, why didn't you pick this? Or coaches salty that, like, they just, players don't seem to listen to them. I mean, there's a whole discussion about why that is happening or whatever, but I certainly think that it'll be good for the teams and raise the level of competitiveness here. I also think that it puts way more value, uh, it puts way more value on the coaches, which is, I think is a very good thing because uh, it's neat to have this like new role essentially, because in a lot of ways it is. I mean, it's the first time they're defining it. This new role that isn't even an in-game role, but is still possibly almost as crucial uh, I think we'll see over time to the success of a team. And I think it'll also be really good for coaches that are out there because now they provide way more value to the teams and so organizations will you know, be compensating uh, along those lines. Yeah, I mean, I think a theme, and we've talked about this a bunch, uh, one of the themes of this offseason is the rise in prominence and sort of importance of a general manager mm -hmm. and a coach. And whether those are two separate roles or one will vary from an organization, but... Given the amount of roster turmoil, assembling a roster is even more important. Talent is moving around a lot more. You need to be a good judge of talent and put those people together. And now you actually get more impact. So people who can make mm -hmm. use of that are going to have an even better impact on their team. Do you give any credence that this is unfairly punishing uh, 
coaches like Monte Cristo was who aren't able to be on site and sort of limiting, in a sense, maybe artificially limiting the pool of available coaches to only sort of real life or in-person coaches? I mean, I think that that will be like an issue because a lot of the... Because my concern is with the lower tier teams. Like, at a, like we saw like Complexity had a coach and EG had a coach. Yeah. Did they? Vulcan had a coach way back when. Uh, but, I mean, Vulcan had, like, a huge sports staff. It was, like, <laughs> really weird. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> um, I think it'll be kind of an issue for the lower teams. It might bring more of a, like, kind of separation between the top tier teams and the bottom tier teams, which is is maybe not healthy, I don't know. But it brings like maybe the cash flow from the LCS now supporting them financially will help those smaller teams recruit decent coaches, but it, like is there talent out there for good coaches? Like, I think that's one thing we talked about this a little about Scar, uh, Travis, is that uh, Scar seems to be the best coach available right now, but the role is so unexplored, it's really hard to know who's actually good at this. Is this enough money and is there enough time to kind of actually really put in place a real coach for each of these teams? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, to speak to Felzi's concerns, I, I don't know if this is any different than the way it normally works. TSM can always bring in and get the best players, uh, whereas somebody like uh, Complexity or whatever probably can't. And so that'll just extend out to the coaches. I think that if I was a challenger team, though, I would look at sort of speaking to what you were, you were asking me, Hunter. Uh, I think that if I was a challenger team right now, I would be thinking about the fact that the difference here Sure, TSM can normally grab the best coaches or, or, you know, like these top teams normally can. However, I think that the difference is, is that it's still somewhat unclear who the best coaches are and what undiscovered talent is out there in order to, to do this, right? So um, maybe there is somebody who's better than Charlie for C9, uh, and, and maybe we'll start to see some of these teams, like, pick up these guys, and they'll be sort of like a secret weapon or whatever. I don't know. I think time will certainly tell. I mean, there's no doubt that... Somebody, you know, like TSM having Locodoco is going to be a little bit more advantageous to, like, um, them than, you know, somebody who is hanging out in solo queue. But I do think that there's probably a lot of undiscovered talent out there for for coaches, um, at least in terms of understanding how the game works and sort of the analysis. And so we'll, we'll have to see how that plays out. I think the pick and ban thing helps out a lot. Yeah, I mean, that's sort of, sort of one question is, like, Having an actual tactical mind or, or someone whose job is far more to focus on that, will that increase the likelihood, especially in this era of uh, strategic diversity, of comps coming in that are really unusual and having a coach there who can say, like, okay, let's go to comp C that we talked about, our, like, split push, everybody's got a spear to throw comp or whatever, you know, whatever their mm -hmm. unusual things. Do you think we'll see more of that as a result of this? I mean, I think the biggest problem with, like, those kinds of, like, unusual comps or, like, you know, very specific strategies and that kind of stuff. The problem hasn't been that there hasn't been coaches. There have been coaches, but nobody really cares about the coach or you know, respects the coach. I don't know. Maybe this will bring, like, a new level of respect for the coaches, but that will be, like, kind of, like, the defining factor of how successful this is. Or, or it might take three more years for coaches right. to really, like ramp up in their technical expertise. Sort of. It should at least shine a light on which coaches are able to influence their players and which ones aren't. And whether that's lack of Maybe. respect or organizational focus or whatever. Uh, Travis, do you think that, uh, that this leaves us in a place where uh, the, coach, the coach will see less of those games where you get these really like terrible pick bans and you, you know, like we saw in Alliance and other, other teams at Worlds, and then suddenly you're just like, how did this happen? How did this even happen? This team lost champion select I mean, so badly. The thing about that specific example is that they said in their promo video about how them and their coach sat down and drafted 20 different pick band strategies or whatever. It's not, I don't know Maybe if Maybe they didn't like, have the death notebook. Like <laughs> you just, do hear that, Travis, a lot, that this is a, like a, a nerf to Cloud9 because now Lemon Nation's like expertise at champ select is, is being sort of spread around more, more broadly. I think it's really too early to say one way or the other how this is going to work out because <laughs> like, okay, so it's really, really easy to be, what is it? Uh, help me out here, Hunter. Mo Monday morning quarterback, is that yes, what the reference yes, is? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> Nailed it. Nailed it. Okay. That's a it's football really reference. to be that guy or the guy sitting on the sidelines watching it and being like, what are they doing, right? I mean, I certainly think there's a reason why 
those kind of things happen. And I think that it's a lot easier to maybe stand uh, out in the audience and figure stuff out than when you're in comms and you're looking at everything or whatever. So we might find that some of these coaches who are like, wow, I coach a team of uh, idiots. Well, they'll, <laughs> we'll find that maybe they're just as capable of making the same mistakes as the players. I don't know. Maybe we won't. Maybe we'll, we'll see all that evaporate. But I, I'm really curious to see. This is just going to be really fun for me at the LCS every week because I'm curious to see how that part of, uh, of the game plays out. Yeah, I think yeah. you'll be able to go to people and say to the coach, like, what happened? How did this happen? And, you know, it's harder to ask players that kind of challenging question, and it's not necessarily, it's easy for them to defer to, like, who's the shot caller or whatever. But now the coach is there. Like, when something weird happens to Champions League, he was, like, on the comms. You have someone you can ask. What, what happened? Yeah. Well, and, you know, one of the things that's super cool about this is that the way, because people already kind of interpreted it this way, like, there was, like, the, Mini Monte Cristo Loco Doco rivalry back when uh, Monte was uh, coaching CLG. Uh, I think it'll be really fun, uh, especially if Wright uh, executes it correctly. And I'll certainly be trying to do this in uh, the content that I create. Like, basically, whenever bands and picks come up, I kind of want it to be like, uh, all right, this is like the um, Charlie versus Loco Doco moment, you know, like where you see these guys and it's like, how are they going to play this out? I mean, obviously, the players will be involved there as well, but. If you if if people and the storylines and that kind of thing turn into a like, all right, like who can who can set up like the almost, you almost consider it like a uh, a Pokemon team, you know, yeah. like whose Pokemon team is better, like set it up, you know, and, and and then throw them out on the rift to see what happens, you know. Um, I think I think this could be really cool. So whatever I I heard about it a little bit before um, the announcement went up, I wasn't sure if it was for sure or whatever, and then. When it hit, uh, a lot of the discussion and Twitter stuff and whatever actually sparked my imagination a lot more when I, than I, when I first heard it, and I got a lot more excited. So I'm very, very uh, pleased with the change. I think it should help fix one of my least favorite parts of the LCS broadcast, which is when it's, you're down to the fourth or fifth person, and, you, and their role has already been picked, but we're zooming in on double lift anyway because he has some like critical decision to yeah. make for like who he's going to pick for their top laner. Now you have like a coach, you have a person whose job it is to be organizing all of that, and we don't have to pretend that you know like they, they're always picking that, their though. thing. Yeah, well, <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. But it should at least it's a new it's a new visual wrinkle to throw into that process. The coach sweating and like looking at his notebook <laughs> or whatever, shaking his head. So moving on, just as we were about to go into taping here, Travis, there was breaking. News News. Also, somewhat on the coaching front, where uh, the new kind of permaban rules were revised and a updated uh, review or decision on incarnation was handed down. Uh, and you were reading this to us just as we were sort of going on air here. Uh, what's what's the news there? Uh, okay, so yeah, the big thing is that Riot has created in the past uh, when they permabanned people uh, for uh, incarnation being the most notable. There wasn't really a they just said indefinitely, and so a lot of people didn't know if that was like forever. Uh, in fact, uh, it was pretty well known that even the players that were permaban didn't really understand like what the next step was for them. Like a lot of them would they they tried like they were kind of getting messages from riots like hey you should bit try they, like they would say hey maybe I can do this maybe I should do an interview or something like that and riot would say so like well that might not be good for your situation <laughs> and then like. It's like, okay, well, what what does that mean? Like, is it ever going to change or whatever? So finally, they now have a clear cut. As of just moments ago, uh, Nick Allen tweet, er, tweeted and posted a very clear cut way of how this works. So um, this these long-term suspensions are split between basically this indefinite and fixed thing. Uh, indefinite cases are up for review, and those ones are... Um, uh, basically, they have to be like, hey, you have learned that you have to be the most perfect person in the world. Like, you, you're not only going to be uh, not toxic, but you are going to be a good force within the scene. Uh, and you can't fuck up at all. And that once we decide that that's the case, then you're good. Uh, the fixed thing is basically like, okay, you screwed up. Not everyone is perfect. We know that you're not super bad but you know like once this comes back we'll just double check and as long as you're not still acting like a jerk you're good so uh and then they sort of define like this minimum suspension thing so basically like you're banned and definitely or for a fixed time and then after a while you're you're up for parole i guess um 
And so, along with this, they said that they re-reviewed uh, two players, Incarnation, Darkwing Jax, uh, and found, despite the vocal, vocal uh, cries from many in the community and the industry, that these guys, well, hadn't necessarily been uh, the best people uh, over the past two years. Uh, it's pretty well known that... Uh, not pretty well known, but a lot of people have said that, uh, oh, you know, Incarnation has performed. He's a great guy. He's he's super cool. Like, he, he's learned that he can't fuck up at all. And, you know, like, he's doing everything he possibly can to be a good player again. And they're like, okay, so Riot basically comes out and says, okay, we looked at him over the past two years, and he's uh, it's been, he's been implicated in DDoSing players last year. He utilized botting accounts basically a year ago. Uh, he also used refer to refer friend fraud of the the refer friend system a year ago, and he was account sharing earlier this year. And so, based on this, we're not going to let him through. Uh, I it's very funny because I I'm sorry to rant so much about this, but I I it just came out and I'm very fascinated. I tweeted about it and said like, oh, I find this really interesting because I feel like it flies in the face again of a lot of those people that were like. Oh yeah, you know, like incarnation. He's an angel. He's he's he solved every, all of his problems, and and immediately I start getting people who are like, "Well, listen, how many of the LCS pros would be banned for using uh, account sharing or whatever?" <laughs> um, and while that's certainly true that I'm sure a lot of people have account shared every now and then, they're not perma banned and trying to prove to the world that they have solved uh, themselves or whatever. So I I honestly think that. Incarnation might be a nice guy. He might not be nearly as toxic as he used to be. But this whole argument of him being this redeemed player is, is perhaps not necessarily accurate. So to boil it all down, though, in Incarnation's case, so he continues to be banned, and they'll review his, his status again before the summer split. But, but for the spring split, he's definitely out at this point. There's going to yes. be no like whisper campaign or Reddit uprising that will get him back in for the spring split. Yes. Yeah, I think this is a really, really good change from Riot, actually. I think on like a previous show when we talked about Incarnation, I said how I was really against the permaban system. I think this is a great reform. I think it makes a lot of sense that it's like, oh, if you get an indefinite ban, then you have to be really positive. Like, you can't... Because if you get an indefinite ban, you did, like, some serious shit, then, like, now you have to be, like, Oh, truly reformed, and he clearly has not passed the test if he's done, like, all of these things. Like, why would you even do refer friend fraud? Like, I don't know, like, how you get into that situation. <laughs> like, but I think this is a much better policy than, like, the permaban thing that we saw previously, even though it was only, like, in one or two cases. And I think this is more cl clarity, which is great, and I think this is a better rule system. So for SK, though, now, especially in light of the other changes, he, I mean, he wasn't allowed to go to Worlds because he was a permaban player, and, and now you, you might have thought he was sort of acting semi as their coach and showing up as a guest or whatever with them in the studio last time. I assume that's out as a result of this. SK will have mm -hmm. to hire a real head coach who will, like, go to the games and be in champ select with them and all of that, and Incarnation is not that guy. Spring split or summer split, maybe that changes, but at least for now, Travis, it seems like he's done as SK's even maybe unofficial I mean, head coach. Yeah. They, I mean, they can still keep him as an analyst. I, I certainly... And, and once... Okay, so you know that he's up for re-review in summer, um, and now... And, uh, I mean, despite the fact that, again, I don't think he's... <laughs> demonstrated Clearly. the right. wonderfulness that everybody thinks. Uh, he hasn't done anything since quarter one of this year. So as long as he doesn't mess up at all, quarter one of next year, he'll be able to say, hey, I've been clean. You can't pin anything on me for the past year. <laughs> um, so I think he'll be he'll be good for the summer. So if I was SK, I would keep him. And I felt as though he was crucial to my performance last year. I would keep him around as an analyst or as a secondary coach. I'd hire somebody to be basically his agent into the, ch the picks and band stuff. Uh, during the spring split, and then, uh, and then I would, you know, hopefully have him back for the summer, even possibly as a player. So yeah, well, yeah, well, yeah. So I mean, <laughs> but it keeps up. So it just add some, some then drama. Then SK needs a new coach. Uh, Last Shadow for Super Hot Crew is coming back, but 
it was coming back in theory, but now he's obviously, he said on, on Reddit and Twitter that he can't be in studio with them every week. He's working on a visa in Korea and is not going to be traveling. So they're now going to need at least a, an official head coach. How much, Travis, uh, do you think we'll see the fake head coach, you know, where like Lena is now the head coach for TSM or whatever, and then you can still have some remote person doing all of that, all of the actual coaching work? Or do you think we'll get a real real head coach in all of these positions. Well, you, you know, I mean, with the TSM example, they'll just have Loco, right? Okay, okay. But You're previous, just, yeah, yeah. you know, the way that, that people have skated around general managers and owners and other yeah, things yeah, yeah. previously. I mean, it's a possibility. I don't think it's advantageous. It's like the skating around, a lot of that, that stuff, I don't think that there is as much of an immediate need for somebody to have like a general man. Like, it's much easier to be a figurehead whenever you're, you're a general manager than it is a coach because in a coach, as a coach or a head coach, you actually have to be in the game and presumably, I mean, at the, for picks and bands and presumably, like you want somebody who is like got that analytical mindset and really quick thinking so that whenever they see uh, like a bit, what happens if you know, like I know that a lot of times uh, people like to plan out. Oh, here's these different scenarios. Well, if somebody decides to pick a champion you've never seen before. You want that guy, that extra guy in the champ select that's going to be able to be like, oh, okay, like, let's sit here for a second. I think I got this, you know. So I, I, I think that it'll be less often. Maybe we'll see a little bit of it in the beginning, but I think that that'll die out over the, the course of the next year. Yeah, I think having a figurehead is not that much different than what they are doing this last year. You know what I mean? Like, that the only thing is that the, that figurehead would be in the comms, like trying to push what they already planned or whatever. Yeah. But, I mean, like the real strength of a head coach is like what Travis would say, like uh, thinking on your feet or whatever, and like that's where you could you should actually be bringing in your like the expertise or whatever. But like they wouldn't be able to do that because they would not be like directly on. So I, you know, yeah, I think. Uh General coaching stuff seems like a tremendous step forward. I think even for Incarnation, this is a step forward. He's now in a mm -hmm. sort of up for parole process that'll come up every, it looks like at the beginning, sort of a little before each and every split. And he's now there's a, he's getting feedback at least more yeah. openly than he was before. And the public is getting more insight into his case so that they can either agree or disagree, but there's some sort of facts available to them. So this seems like a positive step all around. And, and good for, even for Incarnation, even though he didn't get unbanned yet. I mean, I doubt he would do referral friend fraud or whatever if he knew he was going to be up for, like, a thing in, like, three right. months or whatever. Now he's got three, so now four he, like, months. At least, but Stay clean and sober. He should still be positive. I don't know. We don't, we don't know if he's, like, right. Still. I mean, if anything, this should also just be a warning to anybody that ends up in this situation in the future. That, like, yeah, Riot's going to look at your referral friend logs. Like, they're going <laughs> to... They're just gonna rip apart everything you've ever done in this game to to make sure that there wasn't any any sketchiness. Yeah. All right. So final topic, and we'll just sort of see where this goes. Massive changes to league that rolled out uh, Wednesday after an extremely long uh, maintenance situation here in NA, where we were all just waiting, waiting, waiting to get in and check everything out. But now we're in patch well. 420. Just tons and tons of new stuff. Uh, we've all had a chance to play some games and kind of check it out. Uh, Spelzy, what's what's the biggest change? What's the most the biggest surprise? There's too much to go over. We're not, we're not going to describe all the changes, but mm -hmm. what's what's really jumped out at you as so radically different this season so far? The biggest change for me is I don't know. It has to be the jungle, but I mean I think the dragon is like the most one of the most significant changes. They kind of like changed a lot how the dragon works, and I, and the crab and all that kind of stuff has kind of changed how you fight over dragon and how it's prioritized a little bit. And we're see, starting to see that a little bit in Soul Queue. I'm sure we'll see it even more and more in team play. And I think that will have like really weird competitive ramifications. And the jungle, which was also a huge change, I don't know. I, I like their theory a lot. I watched their patch rundown videos, and they were all like, yeah, I agree with all this stuff. This sounds really good. And then yeah. I like played with Sion, and they were like talking about how it was like crazy hard to do all of the buffs, and you couldn't just do buff. Camp buff, buff camp, or yeah. else you'll die. You could totally and I was Scion, <laughs> and I did buff, camp buff, and I was 80% health at the end of it. It was yeah. like, I don't know. So yeah. uh, maybe the tuning needs to be done, but like, yeah, I think the the new jungle items look really exciting, and I hope they spark interest in gameplay. Tons of changes, Travis. Callista came out. Uh, map is official. All of this other stuff. What's What's really jumped out at you so far? Uh, I really feel like for Patch 420 that... 
with the new where you make the trees in the jungle look really interesting. Maps a little bit more. It's got a, little, a bit of a smoky look to it. I don't know. I I've been impressed with some of it. No, uh, I I had a couple games on it last night. It was really fun. Like uh, you get used to the new map really quickly, and I think it's just a little bit easier on the eyes. So I really enjoyed that. Uh, the first match that we did, I was playing with a couple Riot buddies, and uh, they were just like, "All right, get the dragon. All right, get the dragon. Get the dragon. Get the dragon." So we got uh, by the end of the, the game, we got the five. Stacks what? of the dragon, you did? buff, which was uh, hilarious and amazing. We were playing team builder. It was it was a legit game, and uh, <laughs> and it was really fun. I mean, the next game we finished by getting to four. Like I think right now, if anybody what wants to know how to win playing? these games, just like people in solo good stuff or, or even in normals don't know how to like. Focus the dragon thing, so it probably won't for a couple of days. So just get the dragon, get the dragon. Get the dragon. Yeah, yeah. my uh, first game in, we were at a team builder match. I was by myself. The enemy team went with five smites. All five players, five <laughs> smites. They got the dragon at three minutes, and then they never went back. It's like they forgot what even happened. But we are seeing smite and just watching high-level streams. Mid laners taking smite instead of ignite, basically, for that kind of burst damage with a little bit more range and top laners are like smite sort of spreading out as people are looking at this knee jungle items and some of the mm -hmm. smite enhancements and thinking about how that could impact the game we saw this a little last year in the expansion tournament where suddenly you know like targons just hit and there was no jungler for the first weekend because there was now double targons lanes everywhere where do you think this lands in terms of the, terms of the expansion tournament because they don't have a lot of time to adapt yeah. and figure out what's overpowered and what's broken and everything else. I think it's just experimentation. I don't think it... I mean, maybe I'm wrong. I haven't actually watched streams like maybe you have. But I think that Smite mid lane doesn't look that strong. It can't be that strong. <laughs> or if it is, and Riot will nerf that rapidly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think um, that that's just people playing around with it and trying to push the limits and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Strategic diversity... Sounds about right. All I, I'm just going to see nothing but Flash and Smite. Those will be the only summoners <laughs> people take. They just say Flash and Smite. The ultimate diversity. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. I did think it was funny that they're like strategic diversity, but I I feel like everyone's still going to... Like this, when you're coming up with that, I feel like you... One of the best places to target is like Flash. As like, some, like okay, maybe not everyone needs to take Flash. Maybe that's something that only a couple people take, but I don't think that's going to change. I mean, I think... I think it, you know, Scar was tweeting about this today. I think we'll, it's too early to really know, but jungle diversity, I think, has gone down tremendously as a result of this patch. The kind really? of tanky junglers that you thought were going to come back, Sejuani and Nautilus, they're just dead in the water. They just take so much damage, they don't exist at all. And, you know, the non-sustain, damagey type junglers that had, had through Spirit Stone, managed to come back into the game, uh, yeah. like Wukong, there's just no way you just get obliterated early. So some Scion could already jungle. He can still jungle. You know, like Maokai can already jungle. They can still jungle. There doesn't seem to be any new junglers that have resulted out of this. If anything, we've just winnowed out, which may be okay, but we've winnowed out some of the edges of what was already the least diverse role competitively. Mm -hmm. Is Lee Sin, Elise, and They're all fine. Evelyn still, like, dominating? So Evelyn, in theory, has been hit hard. Kha'Zix has to really focus on his W to stay Kha'Zix. up, but I was watching Odd One do buff, camp, camp, buff. And then he probably could have gone to gank if he'd really wanted to today. You just have to focus on it. It's not crazy like, well, I mean, we talk about this at the beginning of every season, like the jungle's so hard, you're getting yeah. one shot by the blue buff, you know, like everything's different. Uh, now now Warwick will shine, he'll be the best jungler in the game again. A week later, it's Lee Sin, and that's all that matters. Yeah. By the way, uh, Hunter, you said that Callista, I think you said she would suck, right? Uh, I, no. I said I. I, I call think, you saying she would suck. I said you'd have to put so much damage into her Q and E to make up for the fact that she had no damage on her R and W. And what's well, I think what you what you know what double lifts first game doesn't even know what his abilities do. Pentakill on you know Challenger Elo shows you is that that attack move passive is so dumb that it's that it creates a tremendous amount of power simply because she can dodge everything all the time. You're like, Shogoth will never hurt Kalista ever because yeah. she'll just constantly yeah, bounce yeah, around Shogoth. and dodge everything that... But yeah. I watched that game, actually, I watched that full game, and like while he got the Penta in that game and he actually kind of owned overall, there were like three or four occasions where he got stunned and then insta-died. Yeah. Like, it, like you have so much vulnerability that like something like a Caitlyn or like a, even an Ezreal who's like a short range with a blink, but his blink is kind of better and leaves you more kind of, kind of defensive capabilities. She I certainly played, 
squishy. I, I played, uh, so in the games that I played last night, I was playing uh, Botlane Support with a Callista, both games, and uh, I can't speak to the viability, though it seems as though she's pretty good, and I feel like like those moments that you're talking about where she has like vulnerabilities, I feel like you can probably compensate pretty well for those in a pro game or whatever, you know, play like a Protect the Callista comp or some, something, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh, you... I will say that she's super fun to play with. Whenever her attack speed gets like really quick, she looks super cool. And also the, I, I okay. Ha, have you guys played her or played with her? Yeah, yes. I played her. Okay, because like her ultimate, I don't. Okay, I don't know what happens basically. So I understand that she grabs me, and then I can like launch myself into people. But it would be so funny because I was playing Blitzcrank, and whenever I would go to throw the hook, uh. It would just be around the time whenever he'd like use the ultimate on me, and suddenly yes, my whole thing would change. And I'm like, oh yeah, this thing is happening, and I wouldn't know what to press. I just know I get another ability, so I just like start <laughs> pressing buttons and clicking in, and every time it would go, it would work. But what is like the thought? What are you supposed to do there? Yeah. Is it like is it does my Q change or what? Yeah, what we were arguing about this last night. Playing? I played a support with a Callista, and it's like so disrupting. I don't know. I don't yes. like. I don't like it at all. It's so weird because like. It happens like in the like the visual cues aren't there. Yeah. I think so. Like the, I was like my, moving, and then I and then someone she sucked me in, and I just like spat right out. Like I did nothing because I was just like she. By me the while I was second game, I found that I would I would instantly feel whenever it happened because like you just know like oh something is happening, and then you know like oh it's Callista or whatever. So uh, my recommendation. Spell Z is to work on your mechanics, and when you get as quick thinking and like whatever as I am in game, like you'll you'll pick it up. You know, it might might be a bit high level for you, but yeah, we were talking about this a a little arguing because when I first saw the ability, I assumed it was going to be really shitty for range supports and really good for like Alistair type tanky supports that you can throw in, and then they do all their tanky CC stuff, and then they're they're suddenly right on top. They don't have to close the gap because this closes the gap for them. But actually seeing it live and you were pointing this out, I think it's the reverse. Range is actually in better position maybe than your, than yeah. your tank. You put a lot of, like, theory, or not like you as in, <laughs> but um, people, they, like, you put a lot of theory, like, oh, it'll toss me right in, and then I'll be able to use all my abilities. But, like, Alistar, Leona, basically every melee support already has a way to get in there. So it's, like, there's no real And you're not actually right in there, because you knock them away anyway. Yeah, so they yeah. have to use their gap closer afterward anyway. So, like, it's... For laning, and she's so much better to lane with the, with a range support, I think, because you get a proc her W, which is just this crazy damage. Like I don't know why it does so much damage. And yeah. Nami, I think, is like the front runner for somebody who's really good with her. Yeah, watching pros do it, it was more than anything they were baiting some with a range support, and then making her invulnerable as Sucking suddenly a lot of in. damage was coming in towards her, and then spitting her back out as sort of a after kind of disengaging a little as a re-engage on champions that have already blown a lot, not as an actual engage tool the way I think, I don't know what Riot intended, but the way it sort of read like it was going to work when it was initially put out. So Dude, I was, used it as an surprise. engage tool. Anytime I was going to hook, I would just <laughs> jump in instead and then like knock somebody up and then I'd like ultimate so everybody was stunned and then I would flash out and heal because I was almost dead and then I would hook somebody to be even more disruptive, and by that point, we would just win the game and then get dragon. Yeah, but not win the game because you just want to get all those dragons, I guess. Yeah. That's the new system. But I'm also kind of That's bitter. what they told me, by the way, the, the Riot guys, they said, because I was like, okay, I haven't played in a while. Uh, I need to, like, figure, relearn this game or whatever. And they, they told me that you no longer win by killing the Nexus as you win by getting five dragons. So it's first to five dragons, and that's how you win yeah. the game. I don't know how you got five dragons. Like I played that's, like five games, and the most anybody got was three. And I had a 50-minute game. Yeah, that's a long time. I mean, it's I wish, 30 minutes I, of I dragons. Wish, okay, I've got my lead client open, I'll tell you. That first game was... Come on, load match history. That first game was 35 minutes, and we got five dragons. Uh, I mean, so but that was a stomp anyway, then. like You must have been just totally stomping them anyway. I, Listen, I, I mean, that's just my normal League of Legends play experience, <laughs> Hunter, so I don't really know what the alternative is supposed yeah. to be like. I mean, I think it's interesting. Dragon and, and the sort of the heat map data showed this that you did at Worlds. Dragon was already the focus of the yeah. whole match anyway, and eventually shifted to Baron a little, but not even. Uh, Samsung White stomped everyone, and they barely fought at Baron at all over the course of the whole tournament. They just dragon, dragon, dragon. So you took the thing that was already really important 
and you made it even more yeah, important. That's it's, what it seems I unnecessary. wanted to talk about when Travis first brought up like the strategic diversity thing. It's like kind of weird because they put a lot of elements in on the towers and all that kind of stuff. But like my assertion from like looking at all the stats is that the team with the dragons, like who wins the dragon fight early, like wins like ninety percent of games or eighty percent of games at least. Yeah, and like. Now, the first dragon, I think, is the most impactful in terms of the buffs. Like, the way they spread out the buffs are weird. Like, that the AP and AD, which I think is the most significant buff, is, like, the first one. The second one is minion, is minion damage. damage, which is, like... I don't know. And then movement the, speed. And then movement speed. Movement speed is really movement good. Movement speed but like, very subtle power. But the 8% AP and AD is crazy. Like, neither of you guys play Twisted Tree Line, and I've no. said this point to, like, so many people, and nobody really cares. Maybe Ooh. I'm just, like, maybe I shouldn't even say this point. But the Twisted Tree Line double portal or double altar thing is 10% AP, AD, which is, like, you can't fight them if they have double altar. Like, right. you have to, like, wait for the 90-second reset and then take one of the altars and then... There's no 90 to second reset here. You have like that Forever. buff for the entire <laughs> game. Forever. Now and it can get evened out, I guess. Yeah, but, but only after six minutes. Like right. if the double altar lasted six minutes, every twisted tree line game right. would be different. Six minutes, and if you don't get it then, you've got to go wait another six minutes. It's not like you're just going you to go fight get it. Them. Yeah. I, don't know. I think it seems like the level one uh. is really strong. But uh, people were fighting over Dragon anyway. Know. Now it has a very tangible, obvious, maybe more user-friendly, like it reads a little bit more yeah, clearly, yeah, yeah, that yeah. Dragon is the thing that you're supposed to do. You get Baron later, maybe you don't even get Baron at all. Like Saint said on League Center, fuck Baron, just go down mid and win the game. It's even more true now, fuck Baron, just go down middle and win the game. You're ahead, you've got all these Dragons or whatever, just blow them out of the water. I don't 35 know. minutes, five dragons in the game, done yeah. and done. Right? It knows. just makes me so scared. Yeah. Because the dragon was already the most, like we said, probably the most important objective, and then they just made it even more important, which makes me think that it will add less diversity. It'll just be like, who can play dragon the best? Sounds like it would increase the snowball factor even more that the team that, because we saw this, the Stats at World show, like if you get even a tiny lead at 10 minutes, you're probably going to go on and win the game. Now, not only do you have a gold lead because you're winning the game, but now you have this a damage amp as well. Maybe we just end up with a more snowball of game, Travis? Dude, I don't know. Okay. But you guys should play with me later <laughs> on tonight. Uh, we'll grab my... Because the, the guy... Who, the, I'll tell you what. I was sitting here while you guys were talking about buffs and all that stuff. Not listening. And I was thinking about how I got the five dragons last night, and it was because... Um, <laughs> Our jungler in that game, who's a, who's a buddy of mine, would just, anytime the dragon was up, would just be like, get aspect. Uh, what, oh, yeah, he said ABC, aspect be closing. That was his, his motto in that game. What? Else? So, you know, like, instead of always be closing, aspect be closing. And so, he like, he's the reason we were able to get the dragon buff the entire time, because he, well, he just played the whole game and led us to playing this whole game just so that we get this buff. And it worked out brilliantly, and I'll try to see if you guys can play with me I mean, and him tonight because it's going to be pretty much the greatest adventure of your entire lives. That's what I want. Wow. And then I was wow. playing with Hunter and I was saying, like, let's pick a jungler who can do dragon. And then he picked, like, Maokai. Who's fine? <laughs> you get all of this. Then later, well, is, I'm like, go to dragon, go to dragon, and you didn't come, and then we died. So that's, that's how that went right there. <laughs> all right. So tons of changes. We'll see how it, obviously this is going to play out a lot. Lots of experimentation. Scara's jungling Anivia, you know, like oh, crazy <laughs> things are happening right now and it'll sort out. I think the expansion tournament should be wide open in terms of strategy, just totally uh, wide open. Yeah. I know there's a lot of people think that's not enough time, but in one sense, I think for viewers, it'll be really exciting to just, people should come in with crazy different approaches to how this is going to work. It'll be really exciting. I wasn't actually buying into that much hype about like people who are like, Oh, the expansion tournament's on the new patch. This is going to be her like a disaster. Terrible. But then after I've seen like how big the patch is, I think this is literally the biggest patch in all of League of Legends history. Yeah, I think Saints' uh, rundown was like over an hour. This is a big <laughs> patch, and I think so. That like makes me really nervous about the expansion tournament. Actually, yeah, it's ex nervous in a good way. Yeah, yeah. for yeah. them, I just right. feel bad for them. And, and for me, as a, the viewers win, the right. viewers win. Right, this. viewers win for sure. I am San Jose, Travis. I can only assume will be on the new patch. That may be uh, the first chance to see teams like TSM and Cloud9, Fnatic and Alliance, who are here in the area, boot camping apparently with mysterious roster of we don't know. Uh, so that'll be the first chance to see the, the top teams on that patch. Is that correct? It is, Hunter. I'm really excited about it. We're going to see so much good action at IM San Jose. I believe that by the time this is posted, I actually said this on Link Center, so I need to stop saying this. We should be doing a giveaway for a couple tickets. 
um, on the on gamer site. But I'm going to be there. It's going to be really exciting. You guys are going to be there. That's right. Uh, it's going to be fantastic. This patch is going to be wonderful, and it makes sense that the first tournament of Patch 420 would be in the Bay Area. So I am not surprised <laughs> in the slightest. So on that note. Let's get out of here. You can follow uh, all of us on Twitter, but also on OnGamers.com, uh, and we'll talk to you all next week.